I do think we can build things into meetings and agendas and processes that not only allow space for curiosity and discussion, but actively try to foster it. One of the most important uh, contributions of a pre-mortem is to help create a culture of candor in a team where people aren't afraid to say things that might be unpopular. What I also try to do in organizations is to normalize it to talk about things going wrong because things do go wrong and that's fine. It's realistic. I love the word realism at work. Things go wrong, we look at it, we learn from it. If you just assume that you're in a meeting and the point of the meeting is to come up with the best solution and then deploy it, that is a different mentality from saying, we don't fully know and we know that details matter. So we're gonna try a few different things and test them. That requires some openness to the idea that you, you don't know. The bottom line here is what really matters. It's not the data that matters, it's the narrative that matters. As a leader, it actually doesn't matter so much what you think went wrong and went right. What matters is the story that your people are telling themselves tomorrow about the team themselves and you. This is Banknotes, Banking Culture Reform. The views expressed in this podcast do not represent those of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System. Hello, and welcome to season three of the Banking Culture Podcast, part of the New York Fed's initiative to drive awareness and change in financial services culture. This season, we'll speak with experts on how organizations can build curiosity and learning mindsets into their cultures. We'll explore tools that are immediately useful in the information that they uncover, but at a deeper level, their repeated use can create a culture that treats mistakes as opportunities for improvement versus moments that instill fear. My name is Tony DiCario, and I'm with the New York Fed's culture team. So welcome, Gary, thanks for joining us today. I'm hoping that uh, for those in our audience that aren't familiar with your work, could you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Gary Klein. I'm a cognitive psychologist. I've been uh, working in the field of naturalistic decision making for several decades, trying to uh, help people understand how uh, decision makers actually function. Can you describe briefly what naturalistic decision making is? Right. So, naturalistic decision making is the study of how people uh, make decisions in real world environments, uh, firefighters, nurses, physicians, pilots, military officers, uh, the naturalistic decision-making community studies them, tries to understand uh, where they get in trouble, what their skills are, how they develop expertise. And it's a, it, um, you can see it as a contrast to, to studying decision-making in the laboratory where you give college sophomores tasks they've never seen before, but then you don't understand the effect of, of experience and you, you don't see uh, how it plays into it. And the naturalistic de decision-making community, there's a, uh, several hundred members around the world, uh, goes out and, and, and doesn't uh, limit itself to the laboratory, but has to learn different domains in order to to get in, in, in sync with, with the, uh, the experienced people who are making really difficult decisions under time pressure and uncertainty. The uh, and naturalistic decision-making was started in roughly 1989. So it's been going over 30 years. A number of books have been published. And anybody who's really interested can attend. There's a naturalistic decision-making association that you can join. And the next conference is going to be held in New Zealand at the beginning of July 2024. Sign me up. <laughs> I want to go. Um, so uh, I, in this season of the podcast, um, one of the things that um, we want to delve into is how to improve decision making by building cultures of curiosity and learning. Um, and encouraging curiosity and learning in an organizational culture context. Um, can you maybe start off by describing why it's important to intentionally build cultures of curiosity and learning? Basically, uh, this, the, the situation we face keeps changing. Technology keeps changing. Challenges keep changing. Uh, the, the routines that we've learned don't 
uh, uh, apply the way they used to. And so if you're not continuing to learn, then you're going to get trapped. And one way to, to learn is to notice things that aren't working the way they used to, to wonder about what you could do better. And that's the essence of curiosity. So curiosity is an, an essential ingredient for organizations to, uh, to move forward. What are some obstacles to building cultures of curiosity? What, what gets in the way? So the, the, the problem is there, there, are, there are just lots of barriers to curiosity. It's very easy to just sit back and say, yes, we want organizations to promote curiosity. But the fact is, they're organizations. And curiosity leads to insights which are disorganizing. So there's a natural tension between what, uh, what we're encouraging curiosity and a smooth running organization, especially for the managers in the organization who want to carry out the tasks within a time frame, within a budget. And now you've got people in your team who are curious, who are coming to you and say, hey, you know what I just noticed? Uh, if we do this, we can really improve our product. We can make all kinds of great changes. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, how much time is that going to add? Uh, what if it doesn't work? Uh, what are the risks? Can we just stick with the game plan and not make any of these kinds of digressions? So there's all kinds of pressures within an organization not to be curious, but to just hunker down and perform the tasks as they originally uh, described. If you're working with a vendor, then there's you know, a, a, a schedule of payments. And now you're going to go to your vendor and say, by the way, we're changing our plan and we're moving the, uh, the, the, the whole time frame. Uh, that's going to change. And the vendor is thinking, what, how, how am I going to get paid? How am I going to pay my employees? Because everything seems to be up for grabs. If you want to train people in uh, a various kind of an environment, you think you would encourage curiosity. But the way instructors work, gosh, I'm an, uh, um, uh, I'm an instructor. I'm supposed to give this platform lecture. I've got uh, an hour to give the lecture. I've got all these PowerPoints to get through. And now you want me to encourage curiosity on the part of the people. You want them to ask questions. And I'm, I'm looking at my watch. How am I going to get through the PowerPoint? Can we just jump it down and follow the script? You see the barrier. Presumably, if you're in a large organization, senior management would love for people to be offering up things they've noticed, suggestions for improvement that are inconvenient, perhaps, for the people that they're reporting directly to, but ultimately are going to improve the bottom line, right? Are going to improve how things work going forward. Um, so how do you kind of overcome that obstacle of the person who is immediately inconvenienced by by that curiosity, by that speaking up? Uh, I'm not sure it's that easy to overcome that inconvenience because organizations always say, we, we want to encourage innovation and we want to encourage creativity. We want to encourage insights. But for the reasons I described, insights are inconvenient. And discovery is, is convenient, and people just want to do their job. And you think that they would be oriented towards the, the bottom line, but uh, the bottom line is kind of distant. That, that, that's something that the, the, the finance people have to worry about. I've got to worry about getting my projects done within the schedule, within the resources, and yeah, there may be a better way to do it, but that's risky. I don't want to incur that risk. I mean, I'm, I'm just you're sort of putting my... Yeah, I, this is how it's always worked. This is the way it works, and that's why the organizations are just very risk-averse. And, uh, you know, they, they, they may have a, a, a policy, let's have a consensus decision-making framework so that uh, everybody has a, a, a chance to weigh in, which always sounds harmonious, but is really terrible. Because if you, if you use consensus, that means everybody on your team gets a veto. And I'm, I guarantee there's going to be at least one on your team who's going to be unnerved by what uh, the, the, the new direction might, might entail. 
and is is going to uh, uh, resist. So you're you're going to have lots of lots of barriers to uh, to curiosity and innovation. So you either end up with the lowest common denominator, yes, uh, or worse than what you described. People kind of don't veto because they 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 go along to get along. Right. Um, so one of the one of the you're, you're known for a number of um, kind of specific tools uh, in behavioral science that help actually build more curiosity and learning into organizational cultures, and one of them is the pre mortem. Um, and I want to make sure to be able to talk to you about the pre mortem. Can you describe what that is? The pre mortem is a technique for uh, evaluating plans. Even uh, as you're you're beginning to carry them out, it's a, a form of risk management. Um, and I have to be honest; I never expected the pre mortem to to be any kind of popular technique. Uh, we just just started using it in my company, and and uh, then I, I published a short article on it in the Harvard Business Review and. My my uh, friend Danny Kahneman talked about it at Davos, and and now people are doing pre mortems all over the the, the place. So uh, the the way a pre mortem works, here's how we started. We we generally in my, in my company at the time, uh, this would have been in the, in the uh, 1980s. Most of our projects went very well, but not all of them. Some of them failed. Not terribly, but disappointingly. And we said, I, uh, after the failures, uh, let's let's do an after-action review. Let's see what went wrong. And then one day I thought, why are we doing this at the end of the, of the projects? Why don't we do it at the beginning of the project and imagine what might have gone wrong? So we started, in our kickoff meetings for projects, we started this pre-mortem routine uh, and the way it works is you have your team assembled around it. Saying, well, you've been going for an hour or two. Uh, this is your kickoff meeting. That's usually where we do a pre-mortem. And so everybody knows what the plan is. They know what their role is in the plan. That's all nicely nailed down. And you say, now we're going to take the next 20 minutes or so, maybe maybe a half hour, not, not, usually not more than, than that, uh, than 20 minutes. I'm going to do this pre-mortem. And in the pre-mortem, I tell everybody, now relax. Everybody lean back in your chairs. You've got a piece of paper in front of you. And and I'm looking into an imaginary crystal ball. I actually do have a crystal ball someplace, but uh, uh, but we we just have people imagine that I'm looking at the ball. And I'll say, it's now six months from now or a year, whatever is the appropriate time frame. And I'm looking in the crystal ball, and oh, oh my gosh, this project has failed. It's been a disaster. It has been a fiasco. The people on the team, when they pass each other in the hall, they avoid eye contact because it's so painful. So I want all of you to understand that this crystal ball is infallible, the project has failed. Now, I want each of you to take two minutes and write down all the reasons why it failed. Start now. And then they start writing, and I hold them to the two minutes. And they're writing like crazy about what caused the project to fail. And then two times up, and now I go around the room to see what people have written, and I, I record what they have. If it's virtual, I'll do it on a virtual whiteboard, or in person, I'll do it on a real whiteboard. And we go around the room, and each person puts what's at the top of their list that hasn't been covered, and we start with the project leader to indicate what's at the top of his or her list, and then we go from there. And that's how a pre-mortem works. And um, we've done research on it, and the pre-mortem technique re- seems to significantly reduce overconfidence and seems to do a better job of that than other comparable techniques like uh, 
you know, uh, pluses and minuses or just general credibility. Well, here's why the cool water works so well. It's because the crystal ball is infallible, so that changes your whole mindset. And now, if, if you just ask people at the end of a planning session, um, let's let's sort of you know step back. Does anybody see any problems? All the pressure is on people not to see problems because you don't want to disrupt harmony. And in fact, you may not see problems because you've spent all this time getting ready. You're all enthusiastic. So the premortem gets you out of that mindset. It changes the mindset. And uh, and you say, okay, it's failed. Why could that be? And it becomes a competition. The people writing things down, they want to come up with items that other people haven't thought of that are reasonable and worth worrying about. So this... Before, if you come up with criticisms, you're getting in the way of the harmony of the team. Now, people are competing with each other to come up with plausible problems that haven't been discussed anymore. And that's how that's how you show you're smart and experienced by the kind of, uh, of uh, pr criticisms you can come up with. Now, the pre-mortem works awfully well. And some people have complained to me that it works too well because you have a team that's all ready to get started, and now you're doing this pre-mortem to reduce their overconfidence. So we added another step at the end uh, where we say, now that we've done this pre-mortem, let's, uh, let's do a, a backup exercise. Look at all the, the, the problems that we've listed, and I want each of you to think about what you can do individually to try to reduce many of these from happening. What can you do? And I'm giving you another two minutes. To why two minutes? Why, why is it two minutes each time? How'd you, how'd you land on that? Yeah. One minute was really frustrating for people because they'd always be writing when I'd say time is up. And if it's more than two minutes, a lot of people would have run out of steam and they're just sitting there. And I want the pre-mortem to be uh, filled with energy. So two minutes seems to work in, in, in most, just about all the teams that I've seen. People, a few people are finishing before two minutes, but most people are, are still writing, but they're, they're about done. So two minutes empirically seems to be the right amount. Mm -hmm. And because the way I understand it, what, what you described is very specific. And these are some very specific steps that you want to follow. You want to make sure that you say, the crystal ball is all knowing, and the project has failed. This is not a hypothetical. It's happened. And that kind of frees people up to is my understanding of what you've described to 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 think in that way it gives it gives them kind of a free pass right. I wanted to ask you about the order in um that you described in that the project manager speaks first. Why is that? One of the most important uh, contributions of a pre-mortem is to help create a culture of candor in a team where people aren't afraid to say things that might be unpopular. And, and the project leader has to set the tone for this in the pre-mortem by coming up with a good criticism right off the bat. And that way, the, uh, if, if the project leader doesn't do that, hasn't done that, then it reduces his or her credibility. So they've got to show that they're willing to take this risk, and that will free up the rest of the, of the participants to take that risk. So the project leader really has to set the tone. And in all the premortems I've run, they always have, because there's a part of us even though we love the plan and we want them to be sustained, there's a part of us that's kind of excited to see, to think about how did it fail? And intellectually, it, it's like fishing, and this is just this wonderful bait, and everybody goes for it because it's a, it's a liberating experience. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Yes, it is. To imagine what's happened. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, how long, how long does a pre-mortem take? 
20 minutes or so. And the reason is we respect people's time. And we, uh, do, um, we, we, we know that the kickoff meeting, people are taking time out of their schedule. We don't want to overdo it. I have uh, uh, a friend, uh, Bryce Hoffman, who runs these as part of his red, red team uh, sessions that go for two days. Uh, but, you know, so he, he has uh, clients who were willing to, to spend that amount of time. I'm trying to insert this into the, the ordinary uh, routine of organizations. And 20 minutes seems, seems bearable. You said that generally you do this at a kickoff meeting. So does that mean kind of after you've laid out the bones of a plan before you start executing the plan? The reason for that is that uh, you can do the pre mortem most effectively if everybody knows what the plan is. So you you know you, you wait until the plan is described and and uh, the roles are assigned. Everybody understands it, and now you're in a much more knowledgeable place doing an effective pre mortem. And what what kinds of projects lend themselves best to this? tool? I think this tool would work for any kind of project that, especially one where there's a, a schedule where something is supposed to be delivered at a certain time, and uh, you can have a team of people who know each other, but I've also done it with teams of people who are just meeting for the first time. Uh, I've had friends do it with organizations that were about to be reviewed by government agencies and they wanted the review to, to go well. And so they had a plan for how they were going to describe their work. And they said, we better, this is too important. Let's do a pre-mortem just, just to make sure we're more, we're, we're more prepared. And so they, they used it there. Mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned, um, that one way in which a pre-mortem is different from red teaming, for instance, is that it's much shorter, tends to be much shorter. Um, are there other kind of distinctions between running a pre-mortem versus other types of kind of forward-looking analyses like red teaming or like um, kind of red hatting, <laughs> um, playing devil's advocate? So I believe that the pre-mortem is included in some of the red team activities. I think the Army had included the pre-mortem, and Bryce Hoffman includes the pre-mortem in his red team activities. The pre-mortem has, has caught on because people resonate to it. They, they, they don't feel their time is being wasted quite the reverse. They, uh, organizations get to a point where people become nervous if they're too in too much time pressure to get started and they haven't done a pre-mortem, it's like driving that, um, and yeah, you, you, you realize you forgot to put your seatbelt on and, and all of a sudden <laughs> you're, you're feeling unsafe because you've, uh, you're, you're now in a risky, a riskier space than you wanted. A devil's advocate is a technique that I like. But the, uh, I, and I'm not completely up on the research, and I may be wrong about this, but my impression from some of the research I looked at is that the devil's advocate technique, where you appoint somebody as the official critic, um, didn't have much of an effect because, and, and the, the article I read speculated that it didn't have much of an effect because. If I appoint this other person to be the critic, that means I don't have to be the critic. And when the person raises criticism, I don't know if I if I necessarily need to believe them. Are these are these real criticisms that the person experiences, or are they just playing a role? I don't know if they're sincere. So I don't I, I don't necessarily take their criticisms or criticism all that seriously. Uh, the pre mortem works because people are coming up with where people are going to be the ones who are carrying out the plan and they're and if they have criticisms they're they're genuine ones they're, they're coming from their own concerns they're, they're not just making things up because that's the role they're playing 
Mm-hmm. Right. And you get you get the ideas of everybody in the room as opposed to one person who's been assigned this role of poking holes. Right. Everybody's in it together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned different types of teams that conduct uh, premortems. Um, some of them know one another. Some of them don't know one another that well necessarily. Um, and you also mentioned that people kind of get used to this and start to come to expect it and feel uncomfortable if they don't do it. Um, and those all sound like kind of markers of culture and how premortems impact culture. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what you think the broader cultural impact is of having a practice of conducting premortems. You are promoting a culture of discovery. You're promoting a culture where people expect to hear things that they hadn't thought of before. As I mentioned before, you're you're trying you're promoting a culture of candor, where people are saying things that ordinarily might have been unpopular. Well, now they're given permission uh, to score and they're given respect if they come up with ideas that hadn't been heard before. You're creating a culture where people are listening to each other and and sitting back and saying, well, I wish I had thought of that. And you're um, appreciating the the intelligence and the experience of their colleagues uh, based on on, on what they're hearing because too often we, we don't get a chance to see our colleagues' minds at work and the pre-mortem uh, showcases that. So those are the, the cultural changes that I think the pre-mortem is achieving. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you have any examples um, that you can share of of times that you've seen any of any of those things happening? Um the only examples are from my own companies where people uh, become used to the premortem technique and um, and and for the opportunity that it, that it offers them to learn from each other. So I, I feel it's had a positive impact on uh, the companies where uh, where I, where we've been using it, and where I get to uh, to interact with the people on a daily basis. I I, I haven't studied follow ups of of other organizations, so I, I I really don't have any evidence for that. I I hope it would help them, but I I, I can't claim that it does. Because mm-hmm. what I find interesting that you described from a cultural perspective is how, because everybody in the room has to say something, you might be surprised by what someone that you didn't expect, you didn't have preconceived high expectations of, who comes up with something that actually changes potentially the outcome of your project or whatever it is that you're working on. I think that's a really interesting kind of cultural implication that opens people's mind up to the fact that there are things they haven't thought about. Right. Um, in a way that I don't think we have that many opportunities to do sometimes. I want to um, talk a little bit more about the premortem um, before moving on to a couple of other tools that you've pioneered. Um, importantly, I want to ask about the conditions that you think need to be present in order for the premortem to be successful. So we've talked about kind of the specifics about how to conduct a premortem. You want to, you know, make sure that you've established that the crystal ball has said that the project has failed. There's no question that it's failed. Everybody gets a chance to talk. We take two minutes um, to write down our thoughts. The leader goes first. Um, And importantly, to kind of build confidence back up. At the end, we talk about how we can mitigate some of the problems that we identified. Um, But all of that assumes a particular environment that will allow for those conversations to take place. Um, So can you describe some of the conditions that you want to make sure are present before conducting a premortem? I confess, we don't worry about it that much. 
Well, I've never seen a premortem fail. Uh, it's just too engaging. People get into the exercise. And um, I once was doing a, a workshop at uh, Columbia Business School. And, and people were making sure that nobody was looking at what they had written. They, they, they were really eager. I, 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 and I think that's one of the reasons it's become so widespread in so many communities, including Wall Street. That's so interesting because I was expecting you to say, you know, hierarchy can get in the way or a lack of psychological safety can get in the way, but you've never seen one fail. A lot of people say, don't be afraid to speak your mind. But you'd be an idiot to take that seriously because you know that there can be repercussions. Um, so, <laughs> so you're you're going to be very guarded. But with a, a pre-mortem, with with the leader going first and voicing a possible problem that nobody had mentioned before, that sets the stage. And, that, and instead of saying, "I want you to feel psychological safety," you're now demonstrating it. You're now living it. And in fact, the thing that people are afraid of is not coming up with a problem, as opposed to a normal day-to-day -day life, afraid of raising a problem. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about um, a couple of other uh, tools that you've worked with. Um, I know that you used to work with the military quite a bit, um, and you worked with simulators, um, which like premortems are kind of a form of practice of thinking about issues that do come up, issues that could come up. Um, you also uh, use a very specific tool in your business called shadow boxing, um, another, another form of practice. Um, maybe you could describe shadow boxing, how it works, um, what are the benefits, what are the potential drawbacks? Back in the mid '80s, um, my uh, research team discovered how people actually make decisions in under time pressure and uncertainty, and we ha and our model is called the recognition prime decision model, and we've written books about it and many articles, and uh, our research we did research with firefighters that was extremely convincing a little over ten years ago. I was having lunch with a, a, a group of uh, firefighters in New York, and one of them, a guy named Neil Heinz, who now retired, described the method that he was starting, he had done his master's on, and I said, that's the method that I've been looking for for decades. And that's the shadow box method. And what happens with shadow box is you put people in tough situations where they have to make decisions. These are simulated situations. And um, Shadowbox is a way for people to see the world through the eyes of experts without the experts having to be there. So I might put you through a situation and I stop the action. And I say, at this point, we've got these four options of what you could do. Rank order which option you would choose first, second, third, or fourth, and write down your reason. But it's not, not just about courses of action, because we might continue the scenario and stop it again. And I might say, at this point uh, in the scenario, you've got three goals to pursue. Rank order which are the most important, second, and third, and write down your reasons. And then we continue the scenario and I'll stop it again. This time it might be about information. Here's five pieces of information. Which would be the most valuable for you to get? Now, we've also had a small group of experts, three to five people who have lots of experience and are widely respected. They've gone through the same scenario you and I. And they've done their ranking of the options, of the goals, of the items of information. They've ranked them themselves. And they've written down their reasons for why they ranked them. Now, we've taken what they've done and we combined it. So we have an overall ranking from the experts. And we synthesize the rationale, what they wrote down, 
and we've combined that. So when you say, here's my ranking for these four courses of action, and here's my reasons, right away I can give you feedback and say, here's what the experts ranked. And you want your ranking to match the expert. That's the game rank part, to match the expert. The real training is when I show you, here are the reasons that the experts came up with, and you look at what they saw in the same scenario you just uh, have been reading, you look at what they came up with and you compare it to what you came up with and you say, I never noticed that. I never thought about that. I never made that infer inference. I never worried about that. And so you're expanding your mental model by seeing the world through the eyes of these experts. But the experts don't have to be in the room. They've already done their work. That's always a bottleneck for training is when do we get access to experts? Here you do it up front in one short session and they're done. And now I'm providing their expertise to you and you're getting to um, become smarter and more sophisticated. And we've done research and we find that after a half day of this training, people match the experts by about 25% their matches are twenty five percent higher than 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 when they started. That in a short period of time, having an impact on their decision making skills. What is that changing that they can so quickly make better decisions after having had this experience? The major thing is changing is their mental model. They're getting smarter. They're appreciating of factors that they might have otherwise ignored. They're appreciating relationships that they otherwise might not have noticed. And they're, uh, they're doing it in, in a training environment, so they're not, they're not being evaluated. We're not claiming the experts are perfect. We're, we're saying you may disagree with the experts, but they're respected for a certain reason. You need, at least need to see what they what they put down, what they were noticing. Another thing that's changing is their minds that they might have a certain mindset about what they need to do. I'll give you an example. I'll work with police. Uh, one of the mindsets we needed that we were asked to uh, to use shadow box to change is for police officers who believe that they, uh, they needed to get compliance from criminals, and even from the public. And the way to do that is through intimidation. I'm a police officer. You'll do what I say. That's the kind of uh, immediate respect that I, that I demand, and I have weapons to back that up. Well, yes, you can get, you can get uh, cooperation through, uh, through intimidation, but that has negative consequences. And we found that there were, in the police and military, there were people who were extremely skilled at getting voluntary cooperation. And uh, I remember one police officer telling me he used to try to uh, get it, use intimidation, but he, he, he didn't think it was working the way it wanted, he wanted it to. And now, every time he deals with a, a, a civilian or a criminal, he has a mindset that he wants that person to trust him more at the end of the encounter than at the beginning. And that changes, that, that moves him out of an intimidation mindset into a trust-building mindset. So we can create shadow box exercises where people um, get a chance to, to see how the experts would handle it and what they might do to, to try to build that kind of trust. Those are the kinds of changes that we think are possible with this kind of shadow box training. That's so interesting. And so you're you're able to kind of mimic the the mindset and the thinking of whomever the expert has been that that created the the shadow box responses or that the expert responses. Do you think um who who should the experts be? And I'm asking this specifically because much of our audience is in financial services. Um, and so presumably 
the CEO, perhaps, um, or a member of senior management um, would want to kind of set the tone for how people are thinking. Um, so do, is, does it matter who the expert is? Um, how much do people have to kind of buy in to the expertise of the expert? They don't have to buy in, um, but they have to at least listen to uh, be open. Uh, if you, your CEO wants to be the expert, well, maybe the CEO isn't that good. But there, there's an advantage of the CEO taking the role of the expert is it, it lets the rest of the team calibrate with the CEO and know how the CEO thinks about it, things. And that's different from the CEO giving lectures and saying, here are what my priorities are. That's different from seeing how the CEO is ranking options when they've got to make tough trade-offs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I have I have two last questions. I'll, I'll combine them. Um, hopefully, hopefully that, that won't be too much. Um, but the first is, um, do you have thoughts on other suggestions for uh, creating cultures of curiosity and learning? And also, um, do you have recommendations for further reading um, or listening or watching that people can do on these topics? Great question. So what can you do to create a culture of curiosity? There's a number of things that you can do. Um, one thing you can do is uh, shadow box exercises that break people out of their existing way of, of thinking and uh, put them in environments they hadn't encountered before and, and, and try to, to move from there. And uh, we, I was just very inspired by a trainer that I met once who said when he was early on in his training career, he thought the idea of training was, was to wait for people he was training to make a mistake and then slam them. That's how he'd been trained. That's what he thought he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And after a decade or so, he, he realized that that's not having any effect. And now if somebody makes a mistake, he wonders, why did they make that mistake? And he asks them. And it becomes a joint activity. And so he, by his, his, own, uh, his own orientation to be more effective, changed his, his mindset. Well, you can, you can use training techniques for, for trainers, that's one thing you can do. Uh, I have other, mm -hmm. but I don't want to miss your last question, which is uh, about books that people can look at, because there are books. And this is shameless and self-serving, but I would be negligent if I didn't mention my own book. So I just came out with a, a book, Snapshots of the Mind, published by MIT Press in uh, 2022. Um, there's my first book that I authored, Sources of Power, uh, How People Make Decisions, uh, back in 1998. I have a few other books, but people who are interested in my work, those are two good places to get started. That's wonderful. Thank you. I think that, that wraps it up. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really enjoy the conversation. For more conversations like this, as well as publications and other resources related to banking culture reform, please visit our website at newyorkfed.org forward slash governance and culture reform.